on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. This is Talk TV News. Good afternoon, I'm Oliver Whitfield Mircic. Rishi Sunak will deliver a speech at 4.30 this afternoon to announce a major shift in the government's green agenda. The Prime Minister is expected to make changes to his core green commitments, including weakening the plan to phase out gas boilers and delaying the ban on new petrol and diesel cars by five years. The Home Secretary says that while the government remains committed to achieving net zero by 2050, we need to put economic growth first. She told Talk TV the government is taking a pragmatic approach to net zero. What is clear is that we remain committed to delivering net zero by 2050 in line with our international agreements. We've achieved a huge amount when it comes to fighting climate change in the last decade or so. We are seen as a world leader. But it's also right that we take a pragmatic and proportionate approach. And fundamentally, we're not going to save the planet by bankrupting the British people. Meanwhile, Suella Bravman has also told Talk TV the UK's migrant situation needs to change as figures from the Home Office show the cost of providing hotels for asylum seekers has gone up from £6 million a day to £8 million. Earlier, she also said migrants can't return to the Bibby Stockholm barge until various procedures have been completed, but acknowledged the situation is untenable. Conservative MP Sir John Redwood has told us the government is heading in the right direction. There's been a little bit of progress in reducing the numbers, but not nearly enough, which the government freely admits. And I think the government is still hamstrung uh, by the long delays in getting a final le legal verdict on one of the main parts of their policy, which is to have a safe place to send people to. Uh, and once that is in place, then you would expect people not to bother to come to Britain in the numbers they're currently doing. The Metropolitan Police officer who fatally shot Chris Caber will face a murder charge, according to the Crown Prosecution Service. The 24-year-old died when he was shot through the windscreen of the Audi that he was driving in South London in September last year. The Met Police officer, who's not been named for legal reasons, will appear at Westminster Magistrates Court tomorrow. The Chancellor says today's news that inflation is down to 6.7% shows the plan to deal with inflation is working. At the beginning of the year, the rate at which prices were increasing was around 11%, which the government has promised to halve by the end of this year. It's decreased, it's decreased by 0.1% since July, which means prices are still going up, but just not as fast. Health leaders have warned of a tough few days for patients in England and Wales as junior doctors join consultants on strike for the first time in NHS history over pay and patient safety. It's understood consultants have offered to call off their strike if they get a pay rise of around 12%, but the government says their latest offer is fair and final. Consultant and... ...but to walk out. They're not politically motivated. They're motivated by the fact that our members have seen their uh, salaries fall in value by 35% since 2008. And what we're seeing that reflected in is the recruitment and retention in the NHS. We've got doctors leaving in their thousands to go and work in other countries where they can earn almost twice as much. And that's leading to a difficulty in the NHS in providing the services people need. And Channel 4's chief executive has described the allegations made against Russell Brand as horrendous. Speaking at the Royal Television Society's Cambridge Convention, Alex Mahon says it's clear that terrible behaviour towards women was historically tolerated in the TV industry. It's after the comedian was accused of sexually assaulting four women between 2006 and 2013. Some of the claims date back to when the comedian was presenting the Big Brother spin-off programme on Channel 4. Russell Brand strenuously denies the allegations. That's the latest. Now for a look at today's weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. It's been wettest across Wales and Cumbria over the last 24 hours or so, with up to 150 millimetres of rain in places, six inches worth, really gusty winds as well. And the worst of the wind and rain will gradually become confined to more southeastern parts of Britain for this afternoon, with warnings in force from 4 pm. The warnings expire across western areas later, but actually it does look pretty wild with some wet and windy weather for western Scotland, whereas elsewhere at least the sun does come out with temperatures around 17 or 18 this afternoon.
Now into this evening, gradually conditions improve in western Scotland, but it will stay really wet across the southeast corner into East Anglia. Strong and gusty winds for a time as well. A horrible evening rush hour, but by the end of the night it does clear up. And as you can see, clear spells and just a few showers for many central areas tonight, and it will be fresher than last night. Temperatures are probably down to about four or five in a few spots across the north. Now on Thursday, thankfully, a little bit of a brighter start with some sunshine, but we will find more persistent rain gathers across the north with quite a gusty wind and elsewhere through the day there will be some showers. So definitely an afternoon for brollies. Temperatures a little lower at around 17 or 18. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. My new show is down to earth, it's immediate, absolutely we are shoving home the questions. How are you going to help us through this cost of living crisis? We're on the side of our vibrant viewers. And coming up this hour, lots to wade through by the way, is this going to be the comeback or the downfall for Rishi Sunak? We remain committed to delivering net zero by 2050. We've achieved a huge amount when it comes to fighting climate change in the last decade or so. But it's also right that we take a pragmatic and proportionate approach. And fundamentally, we're not going to save the planet by bankrupting the British people. There it is. The Prime Minister says he will row back on some of his green policies, gas boilers, banning new petrol cars, that kind of thing. You might imagine this would have huge support among some, but it has divided the Tory party and the business world. Details on that in a few moments. In other news... It's also on strike today, unfortunately, uh, in a position which could have been completely avoided if the government had been willing to come and talk to us and negotiate about pay. They've failed to acknowledge and address the serial erosion of pay which they've overseen over the last 15 years. Well, junior doctors standing side by side with consultants for the first joint strike in the history of the NHS. Three days worth of downing tools, increasing the waiting list and adding utter misery to thousands of desperate patients. These people are playing with life. Quite literally, has your sympathy now gone for striking medics? We'll look at that a little later as well. Plus this. Who do you think you are kidding, Mr. Hitler? If you think we're on the run. It is the story of a group of men who dressed up in Nazi uniform at a festival in Norfolk. It's caused some controversy over whether this is ever appropriate. People got very angry and the men were eventually escorted away by the police. Can you ever go there on that particular theme? We'll look at that in more detail as well. Everything you need to know, all the breaking news right here on Talk TV, 0344 499 1000. There has been, I don't know how long, debates and uh, very animated debates and discussions about what some people see as an evangelical, almost, journey towards net zero. Even when you ask certain experts, you know, what, is, what actually is net zero? I mean, how would it manifest? I mean, it's all very well saying, you know, we want to get rid of all carbon and stuff, but what is the process of getting there? Is it really achievable? And it seems almost mantra-like that this term is wheeled out. Very few people getting to terms with the nuts and bolts or the implications of what it actually means in practical terms. Is it achievable? Is it achievable only if you cause mass disruption? And expensive, your tax money, expensive chaos elsewhere. And that really has been the balance. I think that's been the flavour, if you like, of this debate from the off. It's not the, you know, who doesn't want to clean a planet? We all want to clean a planet. How do we get there? How do we do so in a pragmatic and sensible fashion? And a couple of the issues that have certainly made headlines, one has been about the banning of uh, new, new petrol and diesel cars by 2030, and the other has been the, the whole heat pump gas boiler debacle. They, they've been the two, really. So today, this afternoon, Rishi, and we already know we've got the uh, the mood music already on this, Rishi Sunak is announcing the watering down of those targets, although the overarching target remains, it's just how we get there, which seems to be rather interesting. The PM held a hastily arranged call with his cabinet this morning. They've uh, rubber stamped, if you like, a softening of some of those green measures after it was revealed yesterday evening that key targets were due to be scrapped. Now, 
Many people, of course, will be highly delighted to hear this. That's fantastic. But it's only delaying something. If that is your position on this, it's not getting rid of it. It's just simply delaying what's going to happen anyway. Uh, business has come out and been slightly perturbed by this. We've already heard that Ford have been unhappy. The chairwoman of Ford, Lisa Brankin, has said, our business needs three things from the UK government, ambition, commitment and consistency. A relaxation of 2030 would undermine all three. Do you support Rishi Sunak rolling back on net zero? Let me put the question like that, 0344 499 And as we speak, by the way, I should tell you the King and the Queen have arrived in Paris. There is a state visit, of course, happening there. You can see King Charles and Queen Camilla just arriving there on the tarmac. In fact, not really tarmac at all. It's a nice, chunky red carpet. Of course it is. They are the royals. Uh, they will be there taking along the Champs-Élysées. They will meet the good and the great. There will be a banquet. There will be speeches. People will speak in French and maybe the King will talk about net zero. He seems to quite like that theme as well. Like they're finding it increasingly difficult to see the... It doesn't resonate, does it? Like the Queen arriving somewhere. I remember all those when I was a kid. The Queen's arrived in Kenya, the Queen's in Australia, the Queen's in Canada. These were massive moments, almost, in the diary. And, and the news did not miss a moment to capture all of those points. And there's the Queen in a Land Rover. There's the Queen at a museum. There's the Queen digging and planting a tree for, you know, a certain cause elsewhere. All of this stuff was big. Yeah, now that's King Charles. He's gone to... What does that mean? I mean, is, is anyone keeping up with this stuff any longer? Um, we'll look at that in more detail a little later as well. Um, let's discuss the main issues of the day with George Pascoe Watson, former political editor over there at The Sun. Of course, afternoon to you, George. Hi, Ian. Uh, nice to have you with us as ever. Um, quite difficult. I was trying to work out what is Rishi Sunak... Who is Rishi Sunak playing to with this policy? Uh, because that ultimately would be key to any general election. If it's about the politics and he thinks he can get a few people on board, one would assume those people are kind of already on board. Who's he aiming this at? Well, you're right, Ian. This is all about politics. We have a general election coming up next year. Who knows when it could be, could even be as early as the spring. And uh, the Prime Minister needs to be very, very clear that he's on the right side of common sense and the side of the people he thinks are likely to vote for him or could be persuaded to vote for him. And we know we've done polling at Portland Communications over the weekend, which shows that apart from immigration, uh, net zero issues are quite high yeah. on floating voters' uh, minds. Uh, he's been quite well advised from the polling that um, an issue like electric vehicles, getting rid of uh, diesel and petrol engines, irritates a lot of voters uh, and that he wants to be very very clear that he's on the side of uh, ordinary working men and women in the country so he's taken this decision less i think maybe for what you would think um from a net zero perspective but much more from a can we create elephant traps for the labor party yeah. because if he's able to say we will do this and the labor party don't then there's a, a division, a wedge between him and Labour. What he's trying to do right now to the electorate is send a very big message. With me, you get X. With them, you get Y. And that division will yeah. help clarify who he is and what the Conservative Party stands for. Yeah. And he thinks he's doing that. We're on the side of you know hardworking people, and you know some things are unachievable, unaffordable right now, and only the Conservatives can address. Blah blah blah. I get that, but of course he's upset the motoring industry. We know I alluded to a second ago, Ford, and I'm sure there will be others are saying, "Hang on a second, you know we're gearing up for this, and now you tell us this." And that's a very real concern to some people in the Conservative Party. Is you know whose side are we on here? Yes, we're on the side of the hardworking men and women of this country just trying to go about doing their daily job. They need their cars to do that, and they don't need to scrap them. But at the same time, big business matters, uh, yeah. because they are the employers in this country. And the other point is, if you are to get to net zero genuinely in 2050, you do need industry to lead the way, and that requires huge sums of money in investment. It requires hiring different types of people. It requires the universities churning out differently educated uh, young people to come into uh, factories and uh, engineering labs to design the batteries and design the engines, and design all sorts of things for the future. Sure. And that doesn't come cheap. That requires investment. And that's why the chair of board has said we need consistency above all else. But I think in a balanced situation, Rishi has had to make a decision. The most important thing for me is to put Labour in a difficult position. Does Labour support my decision? 
And if they don't, then that's a win because that's definition and I'm on the side of the people. There it is, George. Listen, sadly, your line is slightly getting the better of us, but George Pascoe Watson, former political editor at The Sun, thank you to him for some meat on the bones of that one. It is, as George said, it's, there's an elephant trap scenario going on here. We're looking after hard-working people who are driving around, working, using their cars, vehicles, vans, trying to install a gas boiler, etc. They don't need any extra expense. We'll just do what's, what needs to be done. And Labour aren't doing that. The reverse, of course, of this. Now, of course, if you couldn't give a, a toss about environmental mental policies or green issues which many people don't then th that's one thing although this by the way doesn't get rid of net zero this is really just a different way of you know they're still going to get to net zero 2050 net zero etc that bit doesn't change uh, but if you do have some interest in environmental matters the conservative party have just announced they are not the party of the environment what does it do for the voter base so it is, as George says, I think this is tactical. I think this is short-term tactics. We will look after the average working man and woman. We're not going to burden people with extra cost on fundamentals like cars and boilers. And there may be more. We'll get the, uh, the full details in his speech a little later. You will hear all of that on Talk TV, of course. Uh, but in terms of the wider issue, net zero remains, of course. And the Conservative Party have marked themselves out as the party not to be listened to when it comes to environmental issues. And that may be, t to you, may well be, well, that's fantastic. Brilliant. I couldn't care. But how does that play to the wider electorate? Do you support Rishi Sunak rolling back on this? 0344 499 1000. We'll get a couple of voices on this in a few moments' time as well. Your comments on the way too. You're watching Talk TV. It's 1.15. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. <laughs> Not working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. Do you believe you can win this war? He's making me cry again. They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award winning. Mwah. Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. We need accountability, we need performance in all walks of life. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a board, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales. Ghislaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I honestly wish I'd never met him. Donald Trump has just said he expects to be arrested at 7.30 p.m. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Yes, Labour has 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, in the polls. No, 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 no. Did he say, yes, I have taken drugs, and they bent the rules, or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it? There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unraveled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1522 and may god rest their souls let it roll If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off short in this <laughs> oh, Get her out! Get her out! Get her out! Some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much! <laughs> very nice of you. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. <laughs> We're now in Barbie world. You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should you be concerned? <laughs> if it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. It's all about me. That's a joke.
Uh, this in from Mr Richardson, who says, what is the sense in bankrupting our own economy when the major polluters in the world are doing nothing to reduce emissions? Even the EU have already done exactly what Sunak is doing now. And that is an interesting analogy, by the way, about what is happening in the EU. The arguments were that we were going further in, on some issues. Um, Germany uh, don't have the same 2030 target. This is about cars and diesel, new cars and diesel. Uh, and many other countries have more ambitious um, targets. So we're not alone if that is the, the answer one is looking for. Let's speak with Tom Burke, former government advisor on climate change, now chairman of E3G, a climate change think tank. Uh, Tom, good afternoon to you. Afternoon, Ian. Nice to have you with us. So, um, what is this? Is this a, a postponement? Are you seeing it from the Prime Minister? Is this an obliteration of what you thought he stood for? I think this is exactly what George was telling you just now. This is Isaac Levito saying to the Prime Minister, we've got to drive a wedge uh, against Labour uh, uh, in the same way that his previous boss, Linton Crosby, did in Australia. The thing to remember about that is it didn't work in Australia. It cost the Conservative government there the election. So I think it's a very high-risk strategy for Mr Sunak. Yeah, and what is that wedge, though? I mean, the, the wedge is uh, just playing to that part of the electorate that feels strongly about banning things like new diesel and petrol cars. <laughs> well, insofar as... So the Tories are on the side of motorists and Labour yeah. aren't. Is it that narrative he wants? I think it's more that the Tories are on the side of people who've been left behind and uh, the Labour's for young... And they all live in the north, somewhere north of London, and Labour's are really supported by lots of young, green, urban people who live in the south, and it's an attempt to make that the choice. I think that completely underestimates the British people, frankly. I think the idea that somehow British people are not having a great time economically, some are willing to give up on the environment and everything else they think is important, uh, uh, on the basis of another flip-flop promise from a government, I think that really underestimates how smart the British people are. In terms of the overarching target, that hasn't gone away. There is still an aim to get to net zero by 2050. So uh, he's still on the same page in that respect, um, Tom, but he's not... He's just looking at a different way of getting there. Would that be well, fair? I know. And, and, and you know, if you want to get somewhere and you start later, it's going to cost you more. So how, what is the sense in saying, we'll save you a bit of money now in order for you to have to pay more later? He doesn't tell you how he's going to get there and what he's going to have to do if we put this off. And remember, at the end of the day, what's determining the rate at which we have to deal with climate change is the physics of carbon in the atmosphere. It's not a sort of choice we have to make about whether we like it or not. Suella Braverman told us this morning on Talk TV, we're not going to save the planet by bankrupting British people. What do you say to that, Tom? Well, I'd say that, uh, yeah, she's absolutely right about that. Just there isn't any chance of, of us doing that. Nothing that we're... In fact, it was very interesting. Uh, when uh, the Office of Budget Review ran a cost of this, it turned out that it would certainly... We'd have to invest about $1.3 to get there, but we'd save $900 million in the process of getting there so why on earth do you think that is going to bankrupt the country it's nonsense do you sense though that i mean there are arguments that you know look we don't need to go this far this quickly we're you know we're not going to die we just have to be sensible we have to reduce things and we can't do it in isolation our targets were quite ambitious somebody a second ago alluded to countries like china and india even the united states you know that th whatever we do is is frankly insignificant unless those guys are on board so you know we were just being a bit too evangelical with the whole thing well i hear that said i don't I give much credence to it. We used to claim, in one way in which we had a legitimate claim to continue to be a global leader in Britain, was because we were actually decarbonizing our economy. By the way, that accelerated the rate at which our economy grew. It didn't slow it down. So I think there's a lot of incomplete stories going on out there about what this will actually do for our economy. But if the government was really worried about the bills for all those working people, it's Mrs. Uh, she was saying this morning she was concerned about it. it should have thought about that when it stopped what it called the green crap and we stopped investing in insulation in people's homes we went down from uh, 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 2 million a year to under uh, uh, under 50,000 a year of insulating people's homes which gets your bills right down right now so I'm a bit suspicious about a government that says it's suddenly worried about doing something about people's bills 
Do you sense, though, that the... the the, the whole thing, the, the, the overarching subject of, of, of green issues, let's, let's call it that, do, do you think it's just been badly sold to the public? Because I, I think a lot of us look at what is going on. It doesn't, we, we don't really see politicians that necessarily fully know what they're talking about. We, uh, we hear them wheel out mantras, they talk about net zero, etc. But then we hear other statistics that actually our levels of polluting in this country uh, you know, obviously it could all be do, we could reduce things as much as we can, but the planet can cope with, you know, certain nasties out there. It can counterbalance things. That's what Mother Nature does. We're not terrible polluters. We have a very small percentage rate of pollution when it comes to carbon. So uh, what, why is this need to, to net zero, which is going to be so seismic, clearly very expensive, with, as far as many people are concerned, very little effect on existing on planet Earth, Tom? Well, as you said, I, I'm not very sure the politicians who are doing this know what they're talking about. And they clearly don't know what the cost of climate policy failure would be. So they're worrying a bit, and I understand rightly, rightly to worry about the cost of climate uh, policy success. But you've also got to think about what the cost of climate policy failure is. Mm. And we saw a little prequel for what that might mean uh, all across the whole of the Mediterranean, where we all go for our summer holidays uh, this summer. That's exactly what climate policy failure means only a lot more of that. So I think you need to get real leadership from our politicians. And in that sense, you're completely right. That's exactly not what we're getting. They've constantly changed their mind, gone this way and that way, to the point where you now have it's people in the motor industry, it's people in the energy industry, it's people in the financial community who are saying to this government, you're getting it wrong and the government isn't listening. Tom, thank you. Appreciate your time. He's Tom Burke, CBE, former government advisor on climate change. Uh, he's now the chairman at a think tank called E3G, that climate change think tank. He thinks the government have really stood on their own elephant trap. But just to reuse the analogy that George Pascoe Watson employed, uh, Carla Denyer is the co-leader of the Green Party who also joins us. Carla, afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Nice to have you with us. Um, I, I mean, I can almost guess the, the answer to your first question. What do you think of Rishi rowing back? Not a lot, I would imagine you'd tell us. Yeah, I mean, if I'm honest with you, I felt pretty unwell, pretty sick when I heard the news last night because this is a, a, a desperate and dangerous U-turn from the Prime Minister, which, quite aside from the impact it will have on our ability to tackle climate change, which you've already heard about, your previous guest explained very well, it'll also harm the UK economy, the well-being of our citizens. Uh, you know, the, these... The, these scrap targets, these delayed targets will mean that, that, that everyone in the UK will have higher energy bills. Uh, we already have energy bills that are around £150 higher because of the Conservatives' previous round of, quote, cutting the green crap under David Cameron a few years ago. The, delaying or, or watering down these targets further is going to give us higher energy bills, colder, less healthy homes, fewer jobs, because we know, and this is, you know, not just the Green Party saying that, this is lots of independent sources as well, that uh, a green transition will create lots of good quality, sustainable jobs all over the country. Uh, it, these changes will also mean that we're breathing in dirty air, which which kills thousands of people prematurely in this country. So there's so many reasons to to make sure that we're transitioning to net zero quickly, but also fairly and making sure we bring people with. But that is them. the point, though, and isn't I it, do Donna? hear. Yeah, I do. But the point yeah. is the fair, the fair thing. Rishi Sunak is saying actually it's just not fair at the moment. You know we are, um, we're not getting rid of net zero. The target remains the same. It's still 2050. We're, we're immovable on that point. We're just going to tinker a little bit to make it easier for people's pockets. Well, but by whose design is it not fair? The Conservatives have been the government for over 13 years. They have deliberately set up their policies in a way that makes tackling climate change the individual's problem when really it should be the government's problem. The government could and should be investing in better public transport, better buses, trains. The Green Party would bring those into public ownership, which means that rather than money going to to private profit, it can go to improving those services. We would roll out a street-by-street -street home insulation programme where uh, those that uh, that can't afford to pay get some help and those that can afford to pay get 
um, you know, a proportionate amount of help, but it's not about paying paying the very wealthiest who can afford to do it themselves. So there's a little bit of intelligent policy making okay. that's necessary there to to to, to direct your investment uh, accurately. But the thing is, the money is there in the economy. But currently, the Conservatives are spending that money on subsidising the fossil fuel companies and subsidising the domestic aviation industry to a much greater degree than they subsidise, for example, renewable energy and public transport. In fact, renewable energy is already the cheapest way of generating electricity in this country, so that doesn't need much subsidy. But things like public transport uh, and insulating people's homes, that is a way that the government could and should okay. be spending its money to make it fair. Instead, it's, it, it's what? It's abandoning these pledges, even though every source, including the Treasury and the Office of Budget Responsibility, have said that it will cost more if they delay. Not less. Why? Why did there, there was a fairly kind of I, I don't want to go as far as doomsday scenario, but you painted a fairly bleak picture, Carla, of of what things will look like if we don't address these things. And perhaps one of the reasons why many people scratch their head, they look at you know, we, we look around us and the world is unrecognisable from how it was thirty years ago in terms. You know, we use less oil than we ever did. We don't produce as much. As we used to, we have homes that are built with more environmental considerations than ever before. By law, we have cars that are unrecognisable. Even the diesel cars are unrecognisable. We have buildings that are constructed in ways that you could never have imagined in terms of insulation and regeneration and recycling, etc. Why has it suddenly got worse all of a sudden? Surely it's only got better over the years. We're, on the, we're in the right direction, aren't we? Yeah, and to be fair, many of those changes you described are positive changes. I'm My background is engineering. I used to work in the offshore wind industry. And so, yes, I'm really proud of the achievements that that industry has made. For example, um, I was involved in the design of some of the offshore wind farms that are currently coming on stream in the North Sea. Uh, and the UK uh, engineering sector especially, I think, has a lot to be proud of there. Why would, our, why would our bills go? You mentioned our bills going up. Why, would, why are they going to go up? Because Rishi Sunak has postponed the, 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 the ban on new petrol and diesel cars. So when I was talking about bills, I was talking about household bills. And that's okay. because one of the other uh, uh, things that Sunak is supposedly going to be scrapping when we hear his speech this afternoon is a requirement for landlords to improve the energy efficiency of properties they rent out. Now, the UK already has some of the lowest quality, leakiest, and therefore most expensive to heat homes in Europe. It's actually really embarrassing how poor quality our rented properties are in this country compared to other countries. So that means people who are renting, who generally tend to be those on lower incomes, are spending much more of their limited income than they should be on heating the air in their home that then blows out through the windows well, whether and you're, but whether you're buying or renting that would, that would be the same wouldn't it based indeed on your, your it, ex it affects it affects everyone whether whether they're an owner occupier or whether a renter but uh but people lag their loss people have, have the... double glaze i mean there's all sorts of i mean the this kind of band c requirement which may or may not remain we will wait and see the details of that later this afternoon i mean even that is up for some level of debate heat pumps are certainly up for a level of debate and many even in the industry people in your former profession arguing that that's possibly not the best way to do this all we're going to do is use more electricity and less gas that will in itself probably put our bills up because anyone who's got a heat pump is probably going to buy a dozen fan heaters to keep their house warm so what I was explaining just now about uh, house insulation is that it saves you money because you're not having to heat all the air in your home only for it to blow out the windows and doors because your home is poorly insulated. The cheapest energy is the energy you don't have to buy because you don't need the heating on because your home is so well insulated that you only need it on for a little burst in the morning and evening rather than having it running all day because your house is so cold. So... Uh, and besides, renewable energy, as I said, uh, is is much cheaper than gas. So when you but say not as reliable only... as, as gas, though, right? It's not as reliable. Actually, no. uh, this is. I'm going to bring in. I my think knows the word you're looking for there, Carla. Right? I mean, no, as an engineer, you worked in this field. It's not as reliable. Indeed. I can guarantee. Are you an engineer? I can no, but I can guarantee I can heat my home with gas or electricity. I can't guarantee I can heat my home with a windmill. You can heat your home with electricity. 
uh, and electricity generated from a variety of renewable sources, okay. geographically distributed across the UK. It's very rare that it's not windy somewhere, um, especially if you're mixing in other forms of renewables, such as tidal, which is extremely predictable. You can predict tides hundreds of years in advance. Having a blend of different kinds of renewable energy across the country combined with uh, demand-side management, which is where you can pay Agreed. people that are flexible but it's not as re it's not as reliable that would be fair right it's not as reliable as gas or electricity i think that is completely up for debate uh you know we're in we, well, i don't think it is really is it i mean it's down to whether the wind is blowing and we can't store the wind at the moment and i we, i'm not I'm not saying this to deliberately be uh, to, to, uh, obtuse in this debate but just the reality is it's not as, as it stands it's not as reliable Ian, I'm desperately trying to answer your question. If you could just let me speak for more than a couple of words at a time, I'll do so. This is where my engineering background is relevant. So I am trying to explain. The technology exists to store electricity or to store it in other ways, such as uh, converting it, converting the energy into green hydrogen, which is a great opportunity in this country once we've got more offshore wind developed, because then it can be stored over longer periods in order to help us out when, for example, uh, there might be a longer cold snap in the winter. Um, the, the, the electricity storage through batteries, which is better for short term, um, but also demand side management, which sounds like a policy wonky thing, but all it means is people that need to use electricity at some point in the day, but it doesn't really matter when. Um, so that could be for charging up an electric vehicle that isn't going to be used for the next 12 hours. So it doesn't matter which what time in that window it is, or it might be uh, paying a little incentive to a factory um, whose, whose production throughout the day can be a bit fluctuated so they can wind it down for a little bit longer and then wind it up again. That's demand side management. And that means that it doesn't matter if the wind speeds vary a little bit throughout the day, because you can predict that. We're very good at predicting wind speed variation. And so we can make the demand match that variation. So yes, it's variable. Wind energy is variable. I agree with you on that. Okay. But it's not true that it's unreliable or unpredictable. This no, is no, the sector I, I worked in for six I, years. No, I get it. You know, it, it's you know, like a waterfall. You know, you create energy in some form. Uh, you mentioned tidal. Of course, it is. I think what what is perhaps at the centre of that particular facet of the debate is about reliability as distinct from whether it works. I think we all recognise that if you get a windmill going full pelt, it's clearly going to generate something. Of course, it might have the help of fossil fuels, Carla, to make it work at the moment. Uh, well, only because currently we haven't completely decarbonised our electricity grid. And so, yes, unfortunately, when they're using electricity from the mains, that will partly be from fossil fuels. But that's not a reason not to do it. That's a reason to build more renewable energy so that it's a larger proportion of the electricity that's used to generate okay. it. All right. Even with the current mix on the grid, uh, the proportion of uh, the, the, the carbon footprint of making a wind turbine is paid back in the first few months of operation and wind turbines last 20, 25 years. So they're still making a massive positive impact. And what the Greens want to do is invest in accelerating that progress so that we can have create lots of good quality green jobs in this country. And the nature of those jobs are that they're not just in London and the southeast. You know, that's that's one of the great things about the green transition, because we need to put wind turbines all over the place because we need to insulate people's homes all over the country. That means good quality green okay. jobs everywhere. Carla, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Carla Denyer, co-leader of the Green Party. Um, over to you on this one, 0344 1000 uh, Just images coming in from Paris. Uh, lovely image of the Royal Cavalcade uh, making its way up the Champs-Élysées. I'm not taking a punt by saying that is the Champs-Élysées. I think that's probably where they are going. They are on their way, I would imagine, to the Élysée Palace. They're about to meet President Macron. Um, a cavalcade of French police officers with the French flag waving like bilio on the side of those motorcycles as they escort the King and the Queen up towards the Élysée Palace in order to meet President Macron. Um, lots happening, of course, throughout the course of this. The president's official residence will be the place that they meet uh, in the evening. Charles and Camilla will be guests of honour at a grand black tie state banquet hosted by Mr and Mrs Macron in the splendour of the Palace of Versailles Hall of Mirrors. Is that not a little confusing? <laughs> I mean, just basing it on the ones I used to go in. That could be bedlam, right? 
Both the King and Mr Macron will address 160 guests who will include high-profile figures chosen for their contribution to UK-French relations. We look forward to hearing more. I'd quite like to see what happens in the Hall of Mirrors, frankly. Um, we're going to talk to you on this in a few moments. Don't go away, Paul, in Portsmouth, 0344 499 1000. Uh, we are, of course, responding to that big question as well of Rishi Sunak. We're getting a speech from Rishi Sunak a little later about rolling back on net zero. He's not scrapping the target. The target is 2050. He still wants to go there. He's just going to tinker a little bit here. He's on your side. This is the, 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 the mood music that Mr Sunak wants to create, that he's on your side. You heard Suella Bravman. She told Talk TV this morning very simply we're not going to save the planet by bankrupting british people that's their line big division between them and labor it makes them the party that is no longer part of the environmental debate that is their risk to some people that is their benefit where are you on this one do you support rishi sunak 0344 499 1000 Yeah, slight apology on my part here. I got so excited that King Charles had gone to France for a two-day break uh, that I misconvoyed him. Um, I think that's a thing in the modern day, part of our modern day parlance. I misconvoyed. The convoy I was referring to was actually Mr. Macron and his wife uh, making their way up the Elysee towards the Elysee Palace. Uh, in fact, the King's convoy is there right now. So as we speak, uh, this one was gathering a little bit more pace than Macron's. I don't know whether they were late or whether Charles or Camilla said, could you put the foot on it, please? 
get us there a little quicker. Now Rishi's ditched all the net zero stuff, we can go faster. Camilla could be heard saying, it ain't Wales, mate. Move it. And off they went. Uh, so they're making their way up the Champs-Élysées now. Uh, Mr Macron and his wife are already there. Uh, they stand ready and waiting to greet the royals. And uh, again, a similar deal as you would imagine on any kind of state visit. This is not a. This is an official state visit that is happening. Hence all the uh, the black tie uh, hall of mirrors stuff of Versailles this evening. Uh, but because of that, of course, there's a huge presence and the security, the French security, flanking the royal car. There it is again, the king's burgundy vehicle that makes its way up towards where Mr Macron, the French president, is waiting to greet the monarch and his wife. So uh, we're keeping our eye on that. Um, and it's a, a, a strange and curious moment that you get in these kind of setups and these royal visits. The protocol is, of course, being well rehearsed. It's all rather simple. So it's been done a thousand times before. Uh, but you know there's a lot of nerves around this kind of stuff. And the King's car is arriving. Mr Macron and his wife wait, standing in a rather dignified, stationary fashion as the King's car and the Queen's car comes to a stop. And out they get. And I'm sure there are some cheers from some Franco-Anglo superfans who are in the crowd there, and the King and the Queen leaving their vehicle. Um, and it's the usual uh, moment of regal and international diplomatic protocol that there are big handshakes all round, and, of course, the natural kiss on both le cheeks for the wives as well. What about that? There it is. The King and Queen arrive, and a very... Uh, reverential bow from Mr Macron to the King and Queen as well as they make their way inside. Paris continues, the rest of us sit absolutely gripped to our seats with excitement as the King arrives in Paris. Show us the Hall of Mirrors, that's all I'm saying. I want to see the Hall of Mirrors. I think they're going to inspect some troops now. That seems to be the thing they do. What is, what's that little bit all about as well? The inspection of the guard. And off they go. Um, let's move to a story of a man who experienced these moments uh, many, many times as the visitor or the visitee. Tony Blair is said to have set up a meeting between Keir Starmer and Emmanuel Macron as part of a covert plan to rejoin the EU. Uh, this is the former Prime Minister, of course, planned the meeting to coincide with the announcement of the EU's associate membership, a scheme which France is said to be keen for the UK to be part of. An insider said Blair is convinced that Brexit is now a vote winner, pushing Starmer to open the door to its reversal in order to win an election. Starmer, of course, met with Mr. Matt. There's never been so many Brits in Paris, uh, but, but certainly at that um, impressive echelons of life. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Starmer, and today, the King and the Queen. Uh, Starmer met Mr. Macron yesterday. The duo are understood to have spoken for about 45 minutes without aides present. What did they discuss? Was it about getting back in the EU? John McTiernan is former political secretary to Tony Blair. Afternoon to you, John. Afternoon. You weren't the source, were you, that <laughs> broke the story? No, the story's bollocks. Um, the story is briefed by, briefed, I presume, over lunch to the Mail and the Express by a Tory special advisor. What do Tory special advisors know about the Labour Party? Nothing. What do they know about lying? Enough. Enough to tell lies and then to keep themselves anonymous. I think it's just ridiculous. And um, the, the story, the splash, should be treated with the contempt it deserves. I, I have to say, when I saw this, I, 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 I'm with you 100%, John. I, I did think, well, I'm not so sure about this. But, of course, yeah. what, 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 I guess there, what I guess there is, is, you know, we know that Mr Starmer is um, absolutely pro-EU and being a member of. I know he subsequently said, I'm not going to agitate to try and get back in. But it's in his DNA, so it wouldn't be... I mean, it's possible, is it not, that he would no. you know, want to have a conversation with Mr Macron about who knows what might be happening in 10 years of that kind of ilk. Would that be fair? Um, so we, we know what's happening in 10 years' time. Uh, Keir Starmer will be entering his third term as Prime Minister. Uh, Macron will be, I don't know, uh, chair of a bank because Macron can't be the president after sure. the end of his term. So he's not talk. No one talks about 10, 10 years in the future. When politicians meet, yeah. they meet for one reason, really, which is to establish the, the discussions they're going to have 
when they can have negotiations. What Europe sees, what Macron sees, uh, what, what all the European leaders see in Kiev is somebody who can be a good faith negotiator with the European Union, doesn't come to this uh, with a knee jerk, everything the EU does is, is, is wrong and that Brexit is perfect, whatever it feels like to us. He comes to somebody who can be a partner with Europe, we're a partner in a major way in defence security, we can be a partner in policing, a partner in all kinds of areas, and they come to, to, to establish the terms. And what Europe wants is the same thing that Ford wants and that E.ON want and that all business want, which is a government offering stability and consistency. This government changed its mind from day to day. You know, Liz Truss makes a speech one day and it comes Rishi Sunak's policy the next, second next day. Nobody can rely on, on any discussions with Rishi Sunak. Sure. Or but I mean, we, we you know, agitators and opposition supporters will say that about any government in power. Of course, I think with Starmer, it is not unreasonable, John, to say, look, you know, he's a, he's a European. He, you know, he, he voted to remain. Well, he so wished so we so had him. Well, there wouldn't be anything wrong well, with you. European. I'm a European. Well, European as in the as in yeah. members of the EU. You take my point. No, no, but I mean, there, there would be nothing wrong with Mr. Starmer saying to Mr. Macron, actually, I thought this was a lousy decision and I'd quite like to find a way back in. No, but no, that, no, that's no, a democracy. No. Why would he not say that? Um, it would be a terrible thing for a leader of an opposition party or a prime minister of the United Kingdom to say something like that in private. The country made a historic decision. In my view, the wrong decision. But you can't you can't say we reversed the decision because I think it's wrong or Keir thought it was wrong at the time. Keir said clearly, the Labour Party said clearly, Brexit's happened. The issue is how you deal with Brexit. Mm. And what we've seen is Brexit has been a disaster for farmers, a disaster for fishermen, a disaster for the car industry, a disaster for musicians. Um, it's hard it's hard to find any Brexit benefits anywhere. So the challenge is how do we work most closely? with our closest trading partner. We work closely on security through NATO and also through other cooperation. We have to find ways just to make this work better and better over the next period. And it's not a particularly contentious issue because um, the agreement we've got that, we, that was signed on, on our departure is coming up for review and renewal. So there's an opportunity to discuss it. It's already mm -hmm. been changed by Rishi Sunak. You know, he changed the, with the uh, with the Windsor framework, he changed what had been agreed in Northern Ireland. So it's not a sin to talk to the European Union. Sure. It's not a sin to make the agreements better. Um, and what is okay. what, what is a bit odd is to try to attribute to Keir Starmer secret motives when he's been really clear about what he said. Because the thing about Keir is, he says one thing and then he does one thing. Like his, so well, he, he, he demonstrably well. doesn't. He's had more turnarounds than a waltzer, hasn't he? No, he hasn't. Come on, John. You, 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 I mean, I appreciate confirmation bias plays a part in this, but, you know, this is a man that stood on the picket line one day saying, I'm with you, and now won't even mention the word strikes. Anybody who, anybody who is preparing to be Prime Minister has to act and look like a Prime Minister, like a proper one, not like the Do you think he's going to start Prime doing that? He is. Like, that's why, that's why he went to Montreal the weekend to... where I was too, but we went to meet Justin Trudeau. That's why he went to... Uh, Paris to see President Macron. That's why he went to The Hague to meet Europol. It's given that the government has checked out, somebody in this country has to stand up and talk about what's in the national interest, the long-term interest. Mm. We don't start negotiating on day one of a government. We start negotiating in the run-up to it. Everybody in Europe knows Keir's going to be the next Prime Minister. Well, uh, maybe there'll be another Tory Prime Minister. Well, you, knows. you talked Are about you him being Prime Minister three times at the beginning of this interview, mm. John. You said he'd be entering That's... his third term in office. Oh, yeah, look, I, I, I foresee a... Um, Nothing but um, Starmer governments till the end of time. Um, till the end of time? This, this, this government, this <laughs> it's not government, Doctor Who. <laughs> this government, as far as I can see, um, at the end of my time, um, this <laughs> government is, def is, is definitely having the fights in the government, which are normally the characteristic of a defeated opposition. So who knows what they'll be like when they are a defeated opposition? I think that's the reality, that... Every other country in the world, every trading bloc, needs an interlocutor. You cannot talk to this government now, um, so you have to find a way of working out what's the long-term British view. And we all know business says it and other people say stability is required. Well, Keir offers stability. Keir offers a long-term view. And I think by offering that engagement, you actually get... Um, an understanding on the other side of what, le what, what, okay. what a future government might be asking for. All right, John, uh, always a pleasure. Thank you for your time, sir. John McTinn and former political secretary to uh, Tony Blair. Uh, I could almost envisage many of you uh, listening and watching that interview with a slightly curious smile on your face. Uh, perplexed, 
I think might be the word. Um, over to you on that one as well. Let's go to some of your calls. Paul in Portsmouth, reference net zero, reference Rishi Sunak. Are you supporting the Prime Minister on this, Paul? Good afternoon. Oh, I think um, delaying the car thing is um, probably a good thing. But I've got so many questions about that lady from the Green Party you were talking to. Yeah, she threw up a lot of questions. Yeah, um, these billions of um, pounds in subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. Where are they from? I think that oil and whatever is taxed to the hills. And then these millions of green jobs. What are these millions of green jobs, what are they going to actually be doing? And then she said that wind turbines, they last for 25 years. Well, Siemens, uh, who are the, one of the biggest makers of wind turbines, have just had to write down two pot of billion pounds yeah. because they were all faulty and they didn't work. And you, you've got Germany who are digging up windmills in order to drill for oil, we're told, no, so, no, uh, no, because there is a shortage coal. in that respect. So, no, But no, Rishi Sunak, Paul, has not, he's not cancelled the net zero target, though, of 2050. Yeah, well, 2050, is, you know, that's so far in the future, isn't it? I mean, we're both, mm -hmm. I'll so probably that. be dead by then. I'll be 46, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, 2050, a lot of stuff's going to happen between now and then. I wouldn't too much about that. That's true. Comes around fast, though, this stuff. Paul, thank you very much indeed. Well, according to John McTiernan, Keir Starmer will still be the Prime Minister in 2050. Uh, I'm not quite so sure about that. I'm not going to nip down to Paddy Power and get him to open a book on that particular proposition. 0344 499 1000. Uh, do you support Prime Minister Rishi Sunak on his uh, rowing back on net zero. Does that have your thumbs up or thumbs down? Because there are business arguments that aren't necessarily quite so favourable as some individual arguments on that. And Tony Blair, what are you making of his re-entry into the debate? This is Talk TV. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored, in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. <laughs> Stop working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. Do you believe you can win this war? Are you making me cry again? They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award winning. Mwah. Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. We need accountability. We need performance in all walks of life. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a board, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales. Ghislaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I honestly wish I'd never met him. Donald Trump has just said he expects to be arrested at 7.30 p.m. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Uh, yes. Labour absolutely. 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, in the no, polls. No, no. Can Come we? On. Did he say, yes, I have taken drugs, and they bent the rules, or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it? There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unraveled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1,522, and may God rest their souls. Let it roll! Yeah. Yes. If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off short <laughs> in this though. Oh, Get Meghan around. Markle, about Get Meghan Mark. Some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice of you. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. <laughs> We're now in Barbie world. You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should you be concerned? <laughs> <laughs> if it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, 
we're talking about it. It's all about me. That's a joke. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk TV News. Good afternoon, I'm Oliver Whitfield Mircic. One of James Bulger's killers, John Venables, has been granted a two-day parole hearing. Venables and Robert Thompson were 10 years old when they killed the toddler in 1993 in Busel, Merseyside. The killers were given life sentences but were released with new identities in 2001. Venables was then sent back to prison in 2017 for possessing indecent images of children. His parole hearing is scheduled for November. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will deliver a speech at 4.30 this afternoon to announce a major shift in the government's green agenda. The PM is expected to make changes to his core green commitments, including weakening the plan to phase out gas boilers and delaying the ban on new petrol and diesel cars by five years. The Prime Minister and the Home Secretary says that while the government remains committed to achieving net zero by 2050, economic growth needs to come first. The director of Net Zero Watch told Talk TV sticking to the tight deadlines were not an option for Sunak. I think you know, with where the Conservatives are in the polls, there really wasn't any alternative but for Mr Sunak to try something different. Just carrying on as they were, saying, yes, we're going to stick to Net Zero, um, was, was not really an option anymore. Something had to change. Meanwhile, Suella Braverman has told Talk TV the UK's migrant situation needs to change as figures from the Home Office show the cost of providing hotels for asylum seekers has gone up from £6 million a day to £8 million. Earlier, she also said migrants can't return to the Bibi Stockholm barge until various procedures have been completed, but acknowledged the situation is untenable. Conservative MP Sir John Redwood has told us the government is heading in the right direction. There's been a little bit of progress in reducing the numbers, but not nearly enough, which the government freely admits. And I think the government is still hamstrung uh, by the long delays in getting a final le legal verdict on one of the main parts of their policy, which is to have a safe place to send people to. Uh, and once that is in place, then you would expect people not to bother to come to Britain in the numbers they're currently doing. The Metropolitan Police officer who fatally shot Chris Cabba will face a murder charge, according to the Crown Prosecution Service. The 24-year-old died when he was shot through the windscreen of the Audi that he was driving in South London last year. The Met Police officer, who's not been named for legal reasons, will appear at Westminster Magistrates Court tomorrow. Health leaders have warned of a tough few days for patients in England and Wales as junior doctors strike on as junior doctors join consultants on strike for the first time in NHS history at all over pay and patient safety. It's understood consultants have offered to call off their strike if they get a pay rise of around 12%, but the government says their latest offer is fair and final. Doctors on the picket line say they are striking to help improve the situation for patients in the long run. All of the colleagues that are outside on the picket line or who are not at work today would far rather be in work treating our patients. But uh, we've been driven to a position where um, the government just doesn't seem to be listening to us at all. The BMA's door has always been open to negotiations, always been open to ways of achieving full pay restoration over a period of time. But the government just closed the door, slammed it shut and just aren't taking interest. And it's affecting doctors and it's affecting patients if they don't come back to the table. We're sorry for contributing a tiny amount to the size of those waiting lists, but the reason we're here is because of the waiting lists and because of the ambulance waits and because of the waits in A&E. And France has rolled out the red carpet to welcome King Charles and Queen Camilla for their rescheduled state visit. The overseas tour was shelved in March due to widespread rioting across the country sparked by a change to the pensions age. King Charles is expected to meet with French President Emmanuel Macron in a bid to rebuild relations between the UK and France. You're all up to date. Now find for a look at today's weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather.
It's been wettest across Wales and Cumbria over the last 24 hours or so, with up to 150 millimetres of rain in places, six inches worth. Really gusty winds as well. And the worst of the wind and rain will gradually become confined to more southeastern parts of Britain for this afternoon, with warnings in force from 4 p.m. The warnings expire across western areas later, but actually it does look pretty wild with some wet and windy weather for western Scotland, whereas elsewhere at least the sun does come out with temperatures around 17 or 18 this afternoon. Now, into this evening, gradually conditions improve in western Scotland, but it will stay really wet across the southeast corner into East Anglia. Strong and gusty winds for a time as well. A horrible evening rush hour, but by the end of the night, it does clear up. And as you can see, clear spells and just a few showers for many central areas tonight, and it will be fresher than last night. Temperatures are probably down to about four or five in a few spots across the north. Now, on Thursday, thankfully, a little bit of a brighter start with some sunshine, but we will find more persistent rain gathers across the north with quite a gusty wind, and elsewhere through the day there will be some showers. So definitely an afternoon for brollies. Temperatures a little lower at around 17 or 18. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. My new show is down to earth, it's immediate, absolutely we are shoving home the questions. How are you going to help us through this cost of living crisis? We're on the side of our vibrant viewers. Uh, it is Nick Talk TV, welcome back, 0344 499 1000. And coming up this hour... The results are on site today, unfortunately, uh, in a position which could have been completely avoided if the government had been willing to come and talk to us and negotiate about pay. They failed to acknowledge and address the serial erosion of pay which they've overseen over the last 15 years. Junior doctors standing side by side with consultants for the first joint strike in the history of the NHS. Three days of downing tools, but what does this mean for waiting lists? The misery of patients who are waiting for treatment. Has your sympathy now gone? for striking medics. Uh, we'll talk about this in just a few moments' time. We've also been discussing whether this could be the comeback for Rishi Sunak. We remain committed to delivering net zero by 2050. We've achieved a huge amount when it comes to fighting climate change in the last decade or so. But it's also right that we take a pragmatic and proportionate approach. And fundamentally, we're not going to save the planet by bankrupting the British people. Well, the Prime Minister says he will row back on some of his green policies, things like gas boilers and the banning of new petrol and diesel cars, that kind of thing. You might imagine this would have huge support among some, but it has divided the Tory party and indeed the business world and indeed a former Prime Minister. I'll tell you about that in just a second. We spoke with the co-leader of the Green Party, Carla Denyer, who says the problem is up to the Prime Minister to sort this out. The Conservatives have been the government for over 13 years, they have deliberately set up their policies in a way that makes tackling climate change the individual's problem when really it should be the government's problem. More on that from you too and this. Who do you think you are kidding, Mr Hitler, if you think we're on? Uh, the story of the group of men who dressed up in Nazi uniform at a festival in Norfolk, which caused more than a little controversy over whether this is ever appropriate. Uh, people got very angry and it meant that the men were eventually escorted away by police. When it comes to dressing up and reenactments, do you ever go there? That is the question. More on that one as well in just a bit. Everything you need to know, all the breaking news right here on Talk TV. Our number 0344 499 1000. And just on the back of Rishi Sunak and his uh, speech within the next couple of hours, you will hear it here on Talk TV, watering down essentially his uh, net zero, not the overarching target, but his journey to get there. We've just heard that former Prime Minister Boris Johnson has warned we cannot afford to falter now or in any way lose our ambition for this country. Uh, this is as Rishi is probably finalising the last few lines of that speech. So there is a divide. Uh, Boris Johnson saying, no, this will be the wrong thing, don't falter. Um, that position from Johnson is somewhat backed up by many in the motor and energy industries. 
Uh, more on that, of course, as we get it. Now, consultant doctors and junior doctors are today taking joint strike action. Doctors have said they will operate Christmas Day levels, uh, that, that kind of service, providing only emergency care. The government says around 900,000 appointments have already been cancelled as a result of doctor strikes this year. In July, junior doctors were awarded a 6% pay rise and £1,250 for the 2023-24 year. But the British Medical Association Trade Union says they are still facing a pay cut in real terms. Consultants also received a 6% rise, but the BMA, which represents nearly 200,000 doctors in Britain, said they are seeking a rise above the level of RPI inflation for the 12 months to April. That's 11.4%. Is this really doable? Let's speak to Dr Arjun Singh, chair of the BMA North Thames Regional Junior Doctors Committee. Arjun, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Uh, the government's position, of course, look, we've given you a pay rise, we've done what we can, we have to be realistic, people are dying, the waiting lists are growing and it's all your fault. So, yeah, this offer that Dave talks about, this pay rise, it's disingenuously disguised as such. It doesn't match inflation this year. So it's another pay cut. It doesn't make a dent in the preceding 15 years of inflation. It still means a doctor is on £15 an hour when they start work. And the government have said that this offer is what we're worth. It's fair and it's reasonable. Well, it doesn't take our pay back to our COVID salary. So the government is insinuating that doctors that went into the pandemic with no protection, who had to wear bin bags, were overpaid, which is quite frankly disgusting. I mean, lots, lots of people, well, very few doctors had to wear bin bags. Come on, Arjun. No, doctors did have to wear bin bags. So, uh, some <laughs> might have done when they couldn't get their hands on some protection, but it wasn't, the, it wasn't the norm, was it? Uh, it was very normal that we did not have PP and people were sharing masks in the pandemic. And this offer that we you know, the amount of money that we're after in total, to contextualise it, is £1 billion net. The government has spent well over £1 billion covering our strike action. So they're putting party politics over common sense and logic. And in fact, 63% of the British public agree that the money spent covering our strikes should have been given to us. Just talk us through as someone who is, you are a clinician, this is your job, your profession, your vocation, you wanted to do it, you studied for it, you passed the exams, you became a doctor. Um, but it's not turned out quite how you thought it would when it comes to paying conditions. Just tell us about your own struggles, Arjan, then. What does it mean for you day to day? Is it the gas bill that's a problem? Is it something else? What's it like? So when I decided to pursue a career in medicine, we're talking about 10 or 11 years ago, and the pay is very different. In fact, we're asking for our pay to be restored to the level that it was in 2008, so very similar to that number. We're not asking for, you know, our ask is not one of largesse. We're asking for £20 an hour for a doctor, far below our global market value. But because doctors' pay has been vociferously cut, we don't have enough doctors. Okay. We're 9,000 juniors short, the same number of consultants, and when we're going into work, we're having to do the job of multiple doctors so we, we, we certainly, no, no, I don't think anybody would dispute that. We need more doctors. I don't even think Steve Barclay would, would dispute that point. But how are you struggling, Arjun? You're, you're, given that you're the doctor I'm talking to right now, just give us a flavour of your own struggles. As a doctor, it's virtually impossible to get on the housing ladder. People are putting off getting into training because you get paid more if you're not in training and you're locuming than if you're a doctor, which is why this pay uh, issue makes no sense. We spend three billion pounds a year on agency staff in the NHS, mm. including doctors, where you have to pay them more money uh, because there's not enough doctors working on a full-time NHS contract because the pay is so poor. And majority of doctors now are thinking about exit strategies and I'm no different. You know, there's a shortage of doctors globally in America, Canada, Australia, and they're recruiting us aggressively they're remunerating us appropriately, they're respecting us accordingly, and they're giving us the environment where we can provide top quality care and we get respected. Is there not a, a wider issue here, though? And whilst people will... You know, how much do you pay a doctor, how much do you pay a nurse, how much do you pay a consultant, etc. You know, of course, you know, people who are uh, trained in, in very specialised areas, <clears throat> I think most people support and want to make sure that you're looked over. Overarchingly, however, 
Uh, it is a good career and it's a great package. It's a job for life. It has all of that and it's in the public sector and sometimes the public sector, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in teaching, wherever it happens to be, does take a bit of a hit. It, it's almost, a, dare I say, a payoff uh, for working in such a secure industry where you've got a nice pension and you can expand, you can move into private if you want to. There is a kind of trade-off here uh, in many respects, is there not, Arjun, in, in the sense that, you know, yes, you have been denied pay rises at incremental levels throughout the last year, but... It'll all come out in the wash. You've got other things that are going for you that people in other sectors could only dream of. You're doing all right, really, aren't you? So you mentioned the public sector. Well, I'll give you a comparison which will shock you. OK, the NHS workforce plan, which the government has endorsed, is talking about tripling the number of physician assistants. Now, physician assistants, as the name suggests, are assistants to doctors. OK, they've not gone to medical school. They've done a two-year degree instead. They're not independent. We have to supervise them. We have to double-check everything they do. And we, you know, they're, they're not regulated yet. Our assistants are getting paid ten to fifteen thousand pounds more than doctors. And the workforce plan is talking about tripling the number of our assistants. Now, aside from the huge patient safety issues of such expansion. It's quite clear that the money is there to go some way to give us a credible... Sure, but, but, but of course your money won't remain static, whereas uh, the assistance money probably will, broadly speaking. Your money can become, you know, well, it's not long before as a doctor you are in the six-figured salary territory, right? So this is another interesting point. We need to, we've had an increase in the number of kind of uh, medical school places and doctors. We haven't had an increase in the number of training places, which is what you require to become a consultant. Now, to get into training to become a consultant, the competition could be something like 10 to 1. We have, we have a huge shortage of people that can't become consultants and will never become consultants and get to that salary that you are talking okay. about. Just in layman's terms, then, if you could, uh, what is it you specifically want? What would you settle for right now? If Steve Barclay was sitting right next to me, what a delight that would be too. Would you? What would the, the figure be that you would put on it, Arjun? Yeah, I'll give you a figure right now, actually. Um, if Steve Barclay can tell me that a doctor that is with £100,000 of student debt uh, is worth £20 an hour, then we'll call off the strikes right now. If he can tell me that a doctor that is going to sacrifice the next 15 years of their life, moving up and down the country, at the whim of the NHS, sacrificing friendships and relationships, is worth £20 an hour, we will call off these strikes. And if he can tell us that a doctor that is the first port of call for 100 patients overnight and is starting life-saving treatment on our loved ones, is worth £20 an hour, we'll call off the strikes right now. And sitting on the other side of me is a, a, a bereaved uh, family member whose partner or child or father, mother, whatever, died because they were denied treatment because of these strikes. What do you say to them? We've been on strike, well, firstly, doctors are patients, my family members mm. are patients, the grandparents that have had appointments and procedures cancelled during these set of strikes. We opened our pay dispute with the government last year, yeah. uh, well before any strikes were planned, and we said, please negotiate with our pay. They said, don't come back to us until you've got a mandate for strike action. And right now, and this is going to shock you, we've got 500 people, 500 British people, dying every single week, needlessly, uh, because there aren't enough doctors. That's according to the Royal College okay. of Emergency and, Medicine. And, and, but, but you would acknowledge, I mean, <laughs> what, what do you say to people who might die? Because You're waiting for a scan. I need a cancer scan right now. I've got to get my pancreas scanned. If I don't get it scanned, there's going to be a problem. It's been postponed again. What do you say to that patient? Look them in the eye. What do you say to them? This decision to go on strike is heartbreaking. No one wants to do this at all. Uh, we're suffering. Patients are suffering. The NHS and the system is, is on its knees right now. We have collapsed. We have people on a normal day, not a strike day, on a normal day, that are waiting more than 12 hours in A&E waiting rooms to get seen. We have people having heart attacks in waiting rooms, that, that die in waiting rooms, people having okay. strokes and being paralysed, because there aren't enough doctors. Why? Because our pay has been cut. We need, we need more doctors, indeed, now, but, but no consolation. Th th those waiting lists are increasing while you're on strike. We've got the person waiting for the scan or the consultation or the procedure. It's being cancelled. Their life is in jeopardy. Would you apologise to them? I would like to apologise on behalf of the British government who have treated... As, as a doctor who's doctors. part of this strike action, would you apologise to somebody in a perilous position for their health or a bereaved family member because your strike action meant their procedure was cancelled? Would you say sorry? Oh, it is a horrific position to be in. I'm very sorry for patients uh, who are undergoing you know, delayed appointments, and I've had appointments that have been waiting for six months or a year 
before they've been seen. We have to ask the question, why were they waiting so long to get seen? Well, there's no doctors to see them. Why? Because our pay keeps getting cut. All we're asking for is £20 an hour. That is not And the strikes continue? They will carry on until you get this? Forever? So we've uh, reballoted our members very recently. And unlike most industrial action disputes where the second mandate is weaker than the first, our one has increased in strength by 7,000 people. Uh, the BMA has a record number of members, over 200,000 people now. It's been deemed as the strongest union in the country. Doctors are acutely aware this is a very last chance we have of restoring our profession, that it's on its knees. It's a last chance saloon, and doctors are willing uh, to go on strike for our profession um, for as long as it, uh, as long right. as it takes. OK, thank you. Dr Arjun Singh, he is the chair of the BMA North Thames Regional Junior Doctors Committee. Uh, response to that, I don't know if that was an unequivocal in the eyes apology, but you heard it there. 0344 499 1000. Not a lot of love for Dr. Singh, who was our last guest, uh, I have to say. I, I can't read out all the comments, and some of them aren't really for air, if you take, my, <laughs> take what I'm saying. Uh, but it's interesting. Uh, Sharon, here's one, says, I've no respect for striking doctors. They have a far better salary than most people. Can't afford to buy a property. Well, my daughter is on far less than a doctor, and she managed to do it. Yes, I'm not... I, I, I'm also, don't be sold, by the way, on the 15 quid an hour thing. Um, couple, uh, two reasons why you shouldn't be sold. Uh, because I think they've taken a slightly iffy marker in inflation to, uh, to get to this, we're on 15 quid an hour. The average doctor is not on 15 quid an hour. 
if you take one particular figure at one moment in time and divide it, factor it and bake it into another figure, you apparently come out with this 15 quid thing. It isn't normal, it's not across the board and it certainly isn't long term. The average doctor in this country is not on £15 an hour, OK? I don't dispute that you're at the coalface. I don't dispute that when you're training, man alive, the workload is unrecognisable to most people for you know, get, gaining a qualification. I get all of that. However, if you are in the public sector, the fact that you have a job for life, the fact that you have a job for life and uh, the, the kind of pension that you and I couldn't get if we went to every high street financial advisor in the land, and I know that's not the only factor, but it's part of it. Uh, and the fact that within that job for life, you can, if you want to, certainly as a consultant and doctor, you can take your qualification, that the money that, that the qualification that was paid for, the money used, paid for by the taxpayer, you can ta take your taxpayer-funded qualification, and I have a problem with this element, and take it into the private sector. And a huge percentage of people do that. Now, I think there's something in that that is worthy of a bit of scrutiny. So, if you factor in all of those elements, then I think the argument that Dr Singh and others are putting forward is somewhat weakened. The bit, the area that I do agree with is that we have a shortage of doctors. We need more doctors, and what we have done is curtailed the amount of doctors that can even get on... The, 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 the list to attend medical schools. We've got a problem there and we need more people. But I also think we need a bigger rethink about how doctors and uh, consultants divvy up their week, how we run the NHS. Is it a, Should it not be a full seven-day service? I don't know why you would close down uh, orthopaedic units or um, other areas, chemotherapy, etc. Why you would stop that on a Saturday and a Sunday, which most places still do. Uh, that's extraordinary. So the overarching picture of the medical profession is not to be taken at any face value on any one headline, all right? And don't be running away with and telling your mate in the pub, they're only on 15 quid an hour, Jim. I heard it on the radio. Not true. Not overarchingly true. 0344 499 1000. Michelle is in London. On this point of the NHS, Michelle, what are you thinking? Hi. Hi, Ian. Thanks Hello. for taking my call. That's a pleasure. I've had three appointments cancelled, right? I went to hospital. Yeah. They didn't even tell me that my appointment was cancelled. That cost me £46 in cab fare there and back. I'm disabled. I can't use my car because of the mayor, the Antichrist of London. <laughs> and then I get another appointment. They left me alone for three years during lockdown. I meant to have cancer checks. And they left me alone, and then they give me an appointment, and then they've gone and cancelled it. And then they've took me off my pain relief, saying that they're epioids. And then they've put me on an, um, um, another epioid, which is codeine. That's no good for pain. Mm. Now, Ian, I think we need a public inquiry into each hospital to find out where the money is going. Find that, start from the managers and work down because you can't be treating people like that. They work for us. Yeah. And that man you had on, he didn't look starving. He didn't look like where he was worried how he's going to pay his gas bill. I, I don't think Dr Singh has got any financial problems. I can't speak fully on his behalf. He talked about not getting on the housing ladder, all right? I mean, it might the housing ladder is tricky to get on no matter what profession you do, and it's not just people on lower income. You know, I, I get... But I, I don't imagine... Uh, Dr Singh did not look like a man who was struggling for the next meal. Thank you for that, Michelle. 0344 499 1000. Uh, Jason's in Wiltshire uh, on this point, Jason. What are you making of it all? Afternoon, Ian. You all right? Yeah, I'm all right. I was just wondering whether I should start a crowdfunder for Dr Singh so he can buy a house. Yeah, I've already started it. He's, oh, you got he's ahead really of me in there. poverty and he, yeah. uh, he's, I feel sorry for him. I'll, really... stick, I'll stick 70p in at the end of the show if that's all right, Jason. Yeah, that's what, actually no, no, it's minimum donations of fifteen pound in. Oh, right, okay. Um, yes, indeed. For, yeah, um, just to reflect the hourly rate. <laughs> yeah, um, it's basically, obviously, regarding <laughs> Mister Mister Singh being so hard done by, um, is he not considered? Obviously, he works for the public sector. He get that lovely public sector pension. Yep. He gets full sick pay when he's off. He get a very good holiday entitlement. He gets. Um, it's like a loyalty sort of scheme that, you know, the NHS staff, they can get discounts all in your various high shops, high street shops and all that lot. 
Um, a friend of mine works for the NHS. If he works on a bank holiday, he gets paid double time, then he gets a day off in lieu for it. Yeah. So if he wants his pay rise, is he going to sort of subsidise some of all these other little perks for his pay rise? Mm. Because I think, to be honest, he's taking the mick. And, and if and they that... really want to go about, you know, they want their pay rise, putting patients' lives in danger for that, I think it's downright disgusting. Yeah. And yeah. I wish that they would let me ring and speak to Mr Singh direct. But... Well, uh, yes, I mean, we, we may be at some point we'll, we'll do such a thing and invite him into the studio and others and, and have that kind of style of debate on this. A great point, Jason. Thank you. Um, and I'm also grateful to John. Um, there was a full fact check on the f uh, £14 an hour rate. Uh, the average junior doctor gets paid 14 quid an hour, a claim that has been repeated. I think he said 15, but um, certainly 14 and full fact looked into that. Uh, the average junior doctor makes much more than this, is their verdict. Depending whether you include extra earnings and time off for holidays, it's probably between 20 and £30 per hour. So twice, twice what Dr Singh quoted, which is what I was warning you about, statistical constructs and the like. Uh, and of course, even when you get to the point of 30 quid an hour, that's only for a period of time. Once you've elevated yourself into a, a, the, the next echelon of medicine, um, your, your salary will uh, very easily and quite quickly increase. Um, and when you're at either GP status or hospital doctor status, you will be in the six-figure salary territory, as will consultants. What's the average consultant? 140,000, I think, something of that nature. And that's just average before you factored in their private earnings as well. 0344 499 1000. We're going to talk about wearing Nazi uniform at, at uh, festivals and reenactments in a moment. It's a fascinating subject. It does divide the room. We'll take some views on that as well. This is Talk TV. Beloved, let us pray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, careful. Who are you praying to exactly? This is like some kind of submarine prime minister. You're making the case here now. A MILF stands for Mother I'd Like to. I'm not going to say the next word. Pop the kettle on. This is the royal tea. Could you keep quiet? I'm trying to read a book. <laughs> <laughs> It's half two on Talk TV. Uh, Peter, is it Peter Cargwell? Three o'clock this afternoon. Peter is in the 3 p.m. hot seat. Um, and this story, a confrontation has broken out at a 1940s reenactment festival in Norfolk when men in Nazi uniforms were challenged by an onlooker. This is an annual themed event. It takes place in Sheringham. It was last weekend. It drew about 25,000 people. It's a big event. Many of them were in period dress and among that group were at least 10 men in Nazi era German uniforms, including some with SS markings on their collars as well as badges featuring the death head symbol and swastikas. The men were confronted by others shouting at them and telling them they were not welcome. I think they had to be escorted away by police in the end. But can you go there when it comes to a reenactment? And I'm thinking of all the uh, areas where uh, the Nazis have been lampooned or parodied or reflected. If you're making a historic film about that era, naturally it would include people who were Nazis. We know this. In addition, in terms of satirising or um, lampooning that era, Dad's Army would be the obvious one. You could throw in Mel Brooks's producers as another one. There'd be a lower low. I mean, the list is pretty much endless. Let's speak to Andy Robertshaw, who's a military historian. He's also a military advisor on the film War Horse. Uh, Andy, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Nice to have you with us. I think we're talking to you from a trench, is that right? Well, I'm very near a trench. I'm actually next to a pillbox right now. There's the, the only place I can get any reception. OK, well, I'm glad you're... you're just explain why you're out there on manoeuvres. What, what's going on? Uh, I run a replica trench system and some Second World War uh, dugouts and other shelters uh, as part of a teaching uh, uh, project here at the Kent Showground uh, at Detling in Kent. I know it well. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I hope you're staying warm there. The weather's about to change being there on the outside. It is. I'm sure it's no problem for a tough guy like you, though, Andy. I mean, on this point of reenactments, I mean, there's all sorts of reenactments. I mean, you're in, at Detling, I remember as a kid, going to that very field and watching jousting yep. and things like that. There's lots of that. Sealed knots, and the list goes on and bring it slightly more to, 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 to well, I was about to say modern times, but if you look back at the last two wars, World War, as in World War One and Two, there are reenactments. 
reenactments of that, people dress up. Um, but it's this Nazi element that seems to have upset people, many arguing that's one area where you just don't go. What is your take on that, Andy? My take is that I've started reenacting in 1969. I've been doing this a very long time. Strangely, I started reenacting in Kent. Um, I have never worn Nazi uniform. I would possibly consider it, if the context was correct, the argument very often from reenactors of the SS is they're portraying the ordinary German soldier. The problem is they actually choose, in this case, to be the SS. So they're very far from the ordinary soldier. These people chose both to reenact and originally to be in the SS, um, so they're not actually portraying the ordinary soldier at all. OK, so they, they've sort of taken it to a, to coin a phrase, the next level. Would that be right? I, I think so, yeah. I mean, the, the, you could argue it's not political. I think that would be a very, very tough call to make um, because, obviously, British soldiers were conscripts, so were many Germans. Mm. Their argument is also that they're not portraying Germans, they're portraying uh, Latvians, and therefore that's somehow OK. Um, I argued very, very long and hard with a film director about talking to, about the enemy being the Germans. He said, well, why? I said, well, because the first victims of the Nazis were Germans, and by 1943-44, many Nazis weren't German. It's, it's, a, it's a, a very odd argument to make. Yeah. I, I would imagine, that, you know, not for one second, I think these people were glorifying it, saying, you know, isn't this no. fantastic, these were the good guys. There's none of that going on, but I suppose it is, whilst we, we can talk about Dad's Army and the producers and all those kind of areas yeah. that have lampooned and um, satirised and, and taken the mick out of the Nazis, um, this obviously isn't that. It's not done in a comedic sense. Um, I, I would imagine they're their defence, if, if they need one, they might say they don't, but their defence would be something on the lines of, look, we're just reflecting part of that era. It was a 1940s reenactment festival, and that's all we yes. were doing. We weren't there to uh, offend anybody. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I could almost go with that. If they just did the ordinary German Wehrmacht soldier yep. who was a conscript, it's the, the choice that they're making to portray the SS with everything that goes with it. We will watch with interest. Listen, Andy, I mean, you've attended many festivals. How, is it unusual for somebody to go and, and, and dress up in, in the Nazi garb? Is that, uh, is that usually no. given a wide berth, or have you seen it elsewhere? Uh, I, I tend to stay away from it. I used to work at the Army Museum. You can imagine that I really didn't want to be associated. And to be perfectly honest, uh, my wife and I would not have survived the Holocaust. So, you know, I have a, a, a very, very, very strong opinion about this. Of course. Andy, thank you for your time. Andy Robertson, military historian. You can see the image there on your screens. Can we have a look at that again? This is the guys that dressed up. The uh, I think there were about ten men. Uh, that put on those uniforms, although Andy there was explaining there's variants of that uniform and they sort of went for the SS um, um, element of the, the pecking order, if that is the right way to look at it, um, which, of course, you know, perhaps gives it another angle. I don't know. Um, does that offend you? Is that, is that an area... I mean, there are... Obviously, I think in Germany, it's, um, you know, the, the, there are certain offences around this kind of thing. I don't think that would be allowed in Germany somehow. I, I don't say that with any qualification. I've got just sense somewhere in my lizard brain hearing that uh, you simply can't do that in Germany in any capacity. But of course you similarly cannot um, extrapolate the likes of Dad's Army and the producers and they're just the obvious ones. I mean goodness me if you went back into all manner. I can remember as a kid watching, you know, light entertainment shows. There's sort of Freddie Stars and people like that that would pitch up on a Saturday night variety show dressed as Hitler. And this, of course, was to lampoon. This was to, you know, parody the ridiculousness of, of Adolf Hitler. It, it was in no way to celebrate anything. But the argument seems to be, look, you know, if you are... Put, and you don't have to be Jewish to have this belief, uh, but one can understand why you might be... Um, more urgently um, offended or concerned, if you are. Uh, but the, the the argument is you just don't, you know, given the grotesque and murderous and horrendous uh, nature of this. And remember, there are people alive to this day who were there 
alive to this day who experienced those atrocities. It's just a, a one little area of reenactment you, you don't tend to, you don't, just don't go there. In a hundred years' time, it might have a different, a different feel, a different perception of that, but now you don't go there. Uh, but it will always be countered with those who say this is about accuracy, it's about reflection, it's about that. It's one thing looking at it in a book, though, isn't it? Or seeing it on a documentary within that context. Seeing people dressed up, you know, dressing up has a kind of... There's a sort of sense of, you know, b b people having a bit of a giggle. And, of course, these men are not having a giggle at the Nazis. There's, there's none of that going on. Was it ill-informed? Does it b b perturb you? Does it bother you in some shape or form? If you speak from a Jewish perspective, perhaps you are more qualified to respond to that. 0344 499 1000. That's where you'll find us. Uh, let's take some more calls and comments. Lisa is in Nottinghamshire. Back to the NHS, Lisa. How are you doing? Hello, Ian. Thanks for having me back on. That's all right. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I just want to say um, to the doctor that you had on um, uh, and to all of those stood on, on, on the strike lines, Nat, I think you're disgusting and you're diabolical people for doing what you're doing. Um, as I've spoken before on this show with my own cancer uh, battle, and I should have had surgery in January of this year that has been postponed and constantly been postponed due to strike action and, you know, with everything being backed up. Um, I've since found another lump. I've had to wait six and a half weeks to get that scanned, which was actually finally done the other day. Yeah. They have seen some suspicious things while doing the scan. So what then would normally happen is while you're still there, is they would take biopsies, you know, so they can get that sent off to the lab to check if it's cancerous on. But of course, there was no doctors about. So I am now in the position of, of knowing I've got something looking untoward um, and, and waiting now to find out when on earth I can actually have any biopsies to see, you know, what we're dealing with. And if it is cancer again, then I need to be knowing. I need to be getting on and getting on the treatment and that. So you need it at the there. earliest, right? There's no. There I, should be no waylaying, no, no delaying on all. this. You need to know now. Exactly. And I think the government needs to do a couple of things. First of all, they need to stop them being allowed to strike like they do with the police and whatnot. Yep. And secondly, if they are going to be allowed to continue to be striking, it should be illegal that they go and do any private work. If you're striking, you're striking. You don't yep. go off and do that the same type of work. It's diabolical. They can only do private work because us taxpayers are paid for them to get the qualifications to hold NHS yeah. results. And I know there's a, sh there's a shortage of doctors and there's all that, but the, a lot of the problem with the shortage of the doctors is because they've allowed us to pay for them to get qualified, mm -hmm. then they go in the private sector. Yes, uh, and I think that is where many people, you know, even those that might have a sympathy with Doctor the, 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 the strike action, uh, I think they depart maybe at that point. The, the tax, your tax funded training, five years or more of training, which you then utilised and employed that qualification into the private sector. Lisa, um, I hope it all comes good for you. I hope those appointments and everything you need happens sooner rather than later. It is, it is a disgrace that people like Lisa are left in that position. And Carolyn Kent makes the very simple point, and I, I scratch my head on this one every time. The Hippocratic Oath states that doctors will, quote, refrain from causing harm or hurt. People are dying because of these strikes, says Carol. I trained as a nurse. It's not a job, it's a vocation. I never expected to be on the top of the wage list. Doctors know what they are signing up for when they choose their career. I'm ashamed of striking nurses and doctors, says Carol. Um, another one here. I spent over 40 years working in the NHS. Disgusting with any doctor or nurse who strikes. They're in the wrong profession and they are happy to kill patients by withdrawing their labours. A strength of feeling enormous on this, as you're hearing. 0344 499 1000. Rupert Bell will join me in a few moments' time. We'll have a little focus on what the king... Yes, we have a king. You might forget we have a king. We don't, the queen is sadly no longer with us. Much missed. We have a king. King Charles III. He's there. And a queen, Camilla. They're both in Paris. They're going down the Elysee. They're having lunch. They're they're going to a hall of mirrors and having a black tie knees up with Mr Macron and his wife and 160 guests. What does it all mean? Should we be interested? Find out more with Rupert Bell next on Talk TV.
Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Q. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. Stop working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. Do you believe you can win this war? Are you making me cry again? They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award winning. Mwah. Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. We need accountability. We need performance in all walks of life. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a board, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales. Ghislaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I honestly wish I'd never met him. Donald Trump has just said he expects to be arrested at 7.30 p.m. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Yes. Labour has 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, in the no, polls. No, no, can we? On. Did he say, yes, I have taken drugs and they bent the rules or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it? There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unraveled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1,522, and may God rest their souls. Let it roll! If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the short end. Let's go. Get her out. Mark, get about get out. Mark. Some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice of you. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. <laughs> We're now in Barbie world. You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should you be concerned? By <laughs> if it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. It's all about me. That's a joke. Couple of points, and we'll take a call as well on the uh, the, the reenactment thing. You know, are, are there areas that are no go areas? Uh, this one comes in from Frank, who says, "What about those dressing up as Roman soldiers who were brutal in their time? Surely those reenactments keep us reminded how brutal armies are, no matter what time in history they come from, or what country. We need reminding uh, that this, you know, so this never." happens again. I mean, there's something in that, but I guess the passage of time... It's why people can tell jokes about the Titanic, isn't it, when you consider, you know, lots of people died on the Titanic, and yet it's kind of used as a, a kind of curious buffer for, you know, it went down as well as the Titanic, that kind of thing. You know, people say that just very casually and nobody really blinks. And this one I thought was interesting from Tony in Yorkshire. It says, uh, Ian, I've been doing the World War I British reenacting for eight years now and I attend the huge military odyssey in Detling each year. The only group there which I've ever had concerns about have been those representing the SS. Very disturbing people, says Tony. And there you go. It's interesting that Tony's been there many, many times and enjoyed it, but that one group thought, yeah, why are you doing that? That's just strange. Or is it? Peter's in Newcastle. What do you make of this, Peter? Good afternoon. Afternoon, Ian. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. What are your thoughts on this one? Well, I, I was in a situation not long ago where I entered my place of work, and there's a locker room where you hang stuff up, and you know, as you do. Yeah. And I walked in one day, and I knew there's a guy there that was interested in the war, ex, ex army years. Um, and I knew he, he bought, um, like, replica jackets, things like that. And I walked in one particular day, and there was a full SS uniform hanging on a hanger. Um, wow. For everyone to in see. your workplace? Was, That's a bit bizarre, Yeah, yeah. so I was, mass I was, like, really offended. So 
I took the, you know, the, the relevant steps, went and seen the manager. I said, I'm refusing to come in until that's taken out. And I think it's an absolute disgrace, if I'm honest, um, a horrendous time like that to be sort of glorified in a, in a replica jacket. I mean, that is... Why did he bring it into work, by the way? Uh, well, he's a strange man. If I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie, he's a strange fellow. But um, I, I, I was like... I, had, I, I sort of froze for a second. I was like, what, yeah, what yeah. am I looking at here? And well, did yeah, he? Okay. What was the, was there any other? Did you manage to kind of gauge any other reaction from from colleagues? They were well. It was gone by the time I was telling colleagues, but they were exactly the same. There was not one person was anything but offended. Yeah, I, I mean, it, there are. I mean, what about? There are people who collect Nazi. I think it was Lemmy from Motorhead that used to collect Nazi memorabilia. He used to say, "Well, it doesn't make me a Nazi if I collected, you know, Victorian furniture. It doesn't make me a Victorian." It's just something some people collect. Is that is that uh, fair? Well, uh, you know, if you talk about the Roman, that's history and that's artefacts there. Yes, there was bad sides of it. But there's nothing nice about the World War Two and what happened. Nothing nice at all. And that particular element of World War Two, which is the defining element, of course, the Holocaust and mass genocide. And as I se said a second ago, and I, I, I'm not making this up, Peter, if I went through my phone right now, I have the numbers of people who are still alive who were in those concentration camps. That's how recent this stuff is, right? It's not for me anyway, is my point, and, and, and it never will be. I hear you, Peter, thank you, and uh, interesting stance as well. I get. I think a lot of people would, would make a similar stance on that. Uh, actually, I, I don't, yeah, I'm bringing this into, I don't know, though, it's history, artefacts versus emotions and perceptions, I guess. There's something in that. Many people making the point that how do you reenact stuff without dressing up, whether it's good or bad. Um, and there's something in that as well. I don't suppose for one second these ten men meant any harm. Perhaps they didn't think it through. Um, and I would assume, and many people getting in touch saying that this does happen at some festivals. Um, it's not a central part. It's not glorified. No one's laughing. It's just simply reflecting and showing that this was one part of that story. And it was a 1940s reenactment festival. Hence... 03444991000. Now, the King and Queen have uh, begun their postponed visit to... I'd forgotten they were meant to be going, weren't they? It was put off uh, to France today with a ceremonial welcome at the Arc de Triomphe and a state banquet at the Paris of Versailles. Charles and Camilla travelled to Paris and Bordeaux for a three-day... and will travel to Bordeaux for a three-day trip six months after it had to be rescheduled because of widespread rioting across the country. That's right, the French were tearing the place up. Paris was an absolute hellhole for a bit. The couple will travel down the Champs-Élysées, did travel down the Champs-Élysées by car towards the Élysée Palace, the president's, uh, president's official residence. And, of course, Mr Macron and his wife were there. They then sat down for some talks. This evening, Charles and Camilla will be guests of honour at a grand black Thai state banquet hosted by the Macrons. Uh, in the splendour of the Palace of Versailles' Hall of Mirrors. I'm still enamoured by the Hall of Mirrors. Does anyone, everyone just look funny in the room. Is that what it is? Hey, Emmanuel, you've gone all small. Is that what it is? Hey, Charles, your fingers have gone all... F oh, sorry. Maybe it's that. Uh, both the King and Mr Macron will address 160 guests who will include high-profile figures chosen for their contribution to UK-France relations. Rupert Bell is Talk TV's royal correspondent. Have you ever... Uh, always good to have you on, Rupert. Have you ever been to the Hall of Mirrors, Rupert? Uh, uh, no, I haven't, uh, sadly. Um, um, but I'm sure it's going to be a very lavish occasion and uh, spectacular. Michelin-starred cooks are coming out to yes. cook individual courses. Um, and the only thing that's not on the menu is foie gras, because uh, Charles doesn't like the way no. foie gras is reared. A lot of people don't, so that's not on. But I believe lots of mushrooms, because the king likes mushrooms. He so like, uh, there likes, you go. He likes his mushrooms. Um, I, I mean, I was making the point earlier, and I know we've been over this territory before about, you know, what is, how do we perceive the new king? Um, as a kid, and you will remember all of this well too, Rupert, those, you know, th these are big parts on the news, the news bulletin of the Queen on tour in Canada, Australia, Kenya, wherever it happened to be. Big images, huge amounts of airtime devoted in, at a time when we didn't have multi-channel TV, but it was there. The, the, there was the, the, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh in the back of trucks or on Land Rovers, you know, standing up, greeting the crowds, etc. These were huge events. Um, it doesn't have that feel anymore. 
Uh, no, and I think there's because there's so much going on that is, you know, people are feeling the pinch uh, left, right and centre. We've obviously got the war in Ukraine. You know, people saying, well, what's the point? It all looks a little over the top, potentially. But there's more to it than just, you know, the, the walk down of the Champs-Élysées to the Arc de Triomphe. It's what goes on behind the scenes of yes. significance. And actually, to put it into context, while it may not be trumpeted all over the place, the fact that he's going to be speaking that as the king in the French Senate, and his mother never did that, shows how much they, how high regard they hold French, the king now. Because he is a, a great Francophile. This is his 35th visit, but a first, of course, a king. His first since 2019. So in terms of the Fran French's perception, particularly sort of maybe amongst their elite, he's very much um, regarded as, as someone they want to put out the, the, the very big red carpet to. And so that is why we're seeing all this sort of pomp and circumstance. Yeah. Uh, huge security operation. But clearly, um, I, you know, there are probably in many people's eyes might be more important things to worry about than a parade going down the Champs-Élysées. That's true. But it is all part of the uh, entente cordiale between the two countries, which occasionally in the last few months have uh, experienced some um, sort of slightly rocky periods. A few, a few wobbles. And, of course, the king speaks fluent French as well, which is always yeah. very welcome when, uh, when he turns up on French soil. Rupert, thank you, as ever. Rupert Bell, Talk TV's royal correspondent. Amanda says, why are you so obsessed with the Hall of Mirrors? I'm not... I'm not obsessed by that. I just think it's quite, it's obviously not the Hall of Mirrors you get in a fairground, but I can't unsee that, you see. So I just have an image that that's what they do. You know, Your Royal Highness, come to the Hall of Mirrors, and afterwards we'll go on the water. I don't know what they do down there uh, in the Elysee Palace, but it sounds like a right old shindig, shindig tonight. Clearly something of a roller coaster. Stop it. Can I, just, say Can I just read this out from Mick, who says, I noticed Dr. Strikers were holding placards provided by the Socialist Workers' Party, but they deny the strikes are political. Deny it all they like. They are political. Peter, what have you got? Hello. Um, I just wanted to pick up, you were talking about people making jokes about the Titanic earlier. Yes. And as someone from Northern Ireland, I have to point out that it was fine when it left Belfast. That's a fair point. It was good in your hands. Was, is that what fine. you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's fine. Someone once asked me if Liz. Not a rivet missing. <laughs> Someone once asked me uh, whether if Liz Truss had a communications problem. I said the Titanic didn't so much have a communications problem as an iceberg problem. That's a fair point as well. Yes. Uh, speaking of Liz Truss, uh, she's been criticised for taking from a fund for ex prime ministers, despite only being prime minister for 49 days. She is entitled to £115,000 a year to run her for office. Her office yes. For her office, not for her herself. Uh, we're also talking about the net zero U turn, yep. of course, and we expect to hear from Rishi Sunak at some stage. Indeed, because he make that makes that announcement this afternoon. Keep it here, Peter Cargwell's next. I'm back on First Edition tonight at 10. This is Talk TV.